here's a few reasons why people don't go to church. I can't come to church until I get my life together. The gathering is how I got my life together. Church is filled with a bunch of hypocrites. And there's always room for a couple more. All they care about is your money. They care about me, not my money. Is there some kind of dress code? Yes, wear some clothes. Church, it just makes me nervous. I was nervous at first, then I felt right at home. I'm not sure. I believe everything you believe. But you can still belong. Church is for a bunch of wimpy, girly men. You want to say that again? You can come to our church even if you were or are Catholic, Baptist, Jehovah's Witness, Mormon. A little bit of everything and a whole lot of nothing. A fellow. A doubter. New to Jesus. See, it's not about a religion, it's about a relationship. So please come to my church where no one is perfect. Beginners are welcome. Where socks are optional, but grace is required. Where forgiveness is offered. Where it's okay to not be okay. Really. Well, good morning. Welcome to the gathering. Anybody still suffering from turkey coma? Anybody? Whose favorite part of Thanksgiving is leftovers for the next three days, right? Oh, oh. We've talked about because it's so much work. Like at the end of Thanksgiving meal, I was like exhausted. We triggered a turkey. I got a Traeger this year, so I'm like, well, I'm going to, you know, put the Traeger on the turkey. Turned out okay. You know, maybe try it again. But by the end of it, it's like so many dishes, and so <laughs> this is so much work. But I just don't think I could go out to dinner because I, I want the leftovers, right? You know, I want to keep making it and have the leftovers. So, well, my name is Corey, and I want to welcome you if you're new with us. I just want to let you know kind of what's going to go on this morning. Um, first of all, we got a welcome card here, a connection card. And if you fill this out, there's a place for your contact information, a place for prayer requests. And if you uh, would like prayer for anything, please take a moment and fill that out. And also, if you fill this out, and at any time, at, at, the, at the end of the service, if you take it and turn it into our guest service, we have a, a gift bag here. It's got a book. It's got a, a gift card to our Yaks on Main Street, coffee shop and restaurant, as well as some other stuff in there. Just a, kind of a, our way of saying thank you for joining us. Um, and uh, as we're going to jump into some worship, and so I want to read from a uh, portion in Isaiah this morning as we kind of go into worship. And... Uh, just prepare our hearts as we as we kind of launch into the Christmas season. Um, this passage, as I said, from Isaiah, and it's uh, proclaiming the coming of Jesus 700 years before he showed up. And uh, it says this, Nevertheless, that time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. The land of Zebulun and Naphtali will be humbled. But there will be a time in the future when Galilee of the Gentiles, which lies along the road that runs between the Jordan and the sea, will be filled with joy. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. You will enlarge the nation of Israel and its people will rejoice. They will rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest. For you will break the yoke of their slavery and lift the heavy burdens from their shoulders. You will break the oppressor's rod. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. 
And this morning as we get into worship, if I just want to encourage you to take a second, and if you guys could t- uh, turn the lights down, or just close your eyes and just take a second to kind of meditate on where, where are you stressing out right now? Where are you, where is your focus? Is your focus on uh, maybe earthly governments or maybe your own a need to take action or your own struggle with inaction? And here, Isaiah is foretelling the coming of Jesus 700 years before he came that, that said that he will be the government, that the government will rest on his shoulders, that, that he will be our wonderful counselor, that he'll be our everlasting father and our prince of peace, that he will establish a government and its peace will never end. And in Jesus, in surrendering to Jesus, we can have a peace that this world does not know. So as we get into the, the music this morning and worship, just, just focus on letting go of maybe the frustrations of the, of the world around you, of maybe your own life situations, and just invite the Prince of Peace to come and rule in your heart. Invite, him, invite your life and, and, and your responsibilities to be given over to Him and surrendered to Him. Because He is our Prince of Peace. Amen.
pray for your light to shine on those places, Lord, that are keeping us down. Pray for healing this morning. And I pray for freedom. i mm-hmm. 
the chorus of the song again and I just want, I want to give you permission to if you're kind of sitting there maybe you're standing there um, but the goodness of God is is actually running after us and so if you maybe if you'd like to stand and uh, and surrender and, and when we surrender right when you know somebody says put your hands up right that's a sur that's a definition of surrender and it's it's a good thing to do to God so I want to encourage you, you know you don't have to do it right don't force somebody to do anything here um, but yeah, if you want to surrender to God, and you can do it seated as well, it's obviously just a posture. So I encourage you to give you the freedom to, and, and we're okay with dancing here too, although I'm, I'm very white and not ancient Hebrew, so I don't dance very well. But if you like to dance, feel free to dance and surrender and just kind of shake it off a little and just, just soak in the goodness of God. All my life.
sit before you this morning and and some of us here maybe feel like that that grape being crushed maybe there's some hopelessness maybe there's some despair maybe there's some resistance and some and some fighting back Lord whatever whatever it is we're experiencing we I know that you are there with us in it I pray you would just continue to carry us Speak to each heart the words that we need to hear this morning from you because you are a personal, loving, and transcendent God that knows and loves and created each one of us uniquely gifted and different. And help us to celebrate that uniqueness in each other as well as that unity in your love that we are equally loved by you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We may be seated. We got uh, two things going forward. Mike's going to share with us here next, as well as then we'll finish out with some communion and and worship, experiential worship uh, after that. I want to let you know about one upcoming event we are having on December 12th, Sunday night, 6 to 8 p.m. We're having a a chili cook-off. It's called our Starry Nights Chili Cook-Off. And so we're going to have, a, a obviously, a chili, not a chili eating contest, right? But <laughs> not a hot dog eating contest where you get sick and throw up. But we're going to have whoever wants to enter a chili. So if you got fancy yourself as having a good chili, uh, you can sign up to enter that and bring it here. And then we'll all taste test and vote. And we'll have prizes, three prizes for the top three vote-getters for that, as well as we'll have a live bluegrass band and Christmas music, and so just a lot of fun, just a great evening to just have fun and, and celebrate. It's, it's somewhat in replacement of what we might normally do as a Christmas Eve service, and just because of different worship musicians and complexity this year, we're not doing a Christmas Eve service, so this December 12th will kind of be that, that Christmas event coming up. So, all right, well, I think it's about all I got with that. Mike, take it away. I thought I lost my notes for a second. I was like, uh-oh. <coughs> Morning, everybody. Glad to have you guys join us, especially to drag your uh, overly full bellies out after Thanksgiving to come in here. Um, we've been working through a sermon series talking about rediscovering our humanity through Jesus. And its focus is in Matthew. But before I get started on that, one of the things that we've been trying to do is bring some focus to our church's core values, the things that we really hold dear, not as far as like theology, but just our, our guiding ideals here. And the one that I'm going to talk about just for a second here is we really believe in freedom, in worship, and in Jesus, right? So we put it this way. It says, life in Jesus is a life of freedom where everything is permitted unless it is specifically prohibited. There's actually a lot more freedom in giving your life to Jesus and taking his yoke on 
having him as your master, than there is being a slave to all the things of this world that would love to enslave you. So that's just something to kind of keep in your mind here. That's, what, that's one of the things that we really try to live and believe. And, you know, we talk about how we will do anything short of sin to reach out, like having long hair, to reach out to people and try and get them into relationship with God and his son. All right, so moving on, our main verse for this series, what's, what's really been our, our key, is Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. And then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Let me teach you, Jesus said. Be my apprentice. Right, what does it look like to be an apprentice of Jesus? Right, if you get in the, uh, the, the old school churches, it's a disciple, right? It's a student of Jesus. And to be an apprentice of Jesus means to reorganize your life around three main goals. Be with Jesus, study Jesus, and do what Jesus did. So that's what we're trying to do here as we dive into Matthew, is study Jesus. I encourage you guys, while you're studying Jesus, to open yourself to being with him. And then do your best to do the things that Jesus did. And now here's the thing. I haven't really struggled with the fact that I'm called to be an apprentice of Jesus. Uh, that, that's pretty basic. That feels pretty clear, you know, clear cut. We know we're supposed to be one of his students. But what's been really hard for me personally has been understanding that I wasn't going to be rejected if I wasn't a good enough apprentice. Anybody else have that, that struggle? Like, I, I can't be your student, God. I can't follow you, Jesus, because I know I'm going to mess up. Right? For a good portion of my life, I was so convinced of this eminent rejection that I rejected him first. You're not going to reject me. I reject you. Right? We do that in relationship too, right? Oh, they, they, they might be about to reject me. I, I wash my hands of you first. I, I rejected you. Right? I get the power. I'm not getting hurt. I'm going to feel powerful. I'm not going to be vulnerable. I'm going to be on the defense. Right? I spent my time trying to convince myself that I didn't need to answer that call to be an apprentice. That was risky. I was vulnerable if I was doing that. As I've thought about it, I've realized a big part of my problem was my early exposure to what Christianity was, what it meant to be a Christian. Right, my exposure, if I'm honest, was really to a watered-down, processed, overly simplified version of Christianity. Because a lot of us as, as leaders in the church, it's kind of scary to get into the difficult part. It's a lot easier to just present, you know, the nice stuff. Right? I heard the things like, you know, Jesus loves me. Yes, I know. I can only wear for the Bible tells me so, right? Moses was good. The Pharaoh was bad. David was the greatest. Pontius Pilate was terrible. The good guys were good, and the bad guys were bad. And God so loved the world that he had to send Jesus to save it. I also heard from a lot of church leaders that they had it all figured out. 
don't think I ever heard, I don't know. Anything that was brought up that might have caused the I don't know, man, the subject was changed so quick you got whiplash trying to keep up with it. So like an overprotected child that doesn't have the skills to cope with the real world, I was an overprotected Christian that hadn't been given the skills to cope with real Christianity. I didn't know how to deal with those real, imperfect, messy, difficult stories and people that the Bible is filled with. I was unaware, unaware and unprepared for the broken people that these stories were talking about. See, I had this misguided impression that God only worked with perfect people. That was not me. That kept me out of the doors of a church for so long. I, I knew I wasn't good enough to live up to that standard. Right? The Bible says we're to be perfect as God is perfect. And I know I'm not there. So before he can convict me of that, I wash my hands of him. At least I tried to. But he wouldn't let go. Somehow, even with all of that baggage, all of that imperfection, God drug me kicking and screaming until the point that I've been up here. And it's been amazing. And now here's the thing. I don't want to interpret the Bible for you. I do not see that as my reason for being up here. I want to tell my story and create a sense of curiosity in you so you decide you want to get to know the Bible. So you decide you want to have a relationship with God and His Son and all that they have for you. I don't just want to quote those easy, feel-good passages that give you a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling when you drop your money in our offerings. I don't want to scare you with those fire and brimstone passages so that you do what I say God says you have to do. I do want to share with you some of my personal journey. Some of the things that God has given me to help me through the difficult, messy thing that we call life. Including those struggles. I'm going to do my best not to hide or minimize those difficult parts. But to highlight some of the ways that I've actually managed to grow by diving in and wrestling with those difficult parts. Right now, how many people know the story of David and Goliath? Right? Yeah, just about everybody, even, even, you know, unchurched people know all about David and Goliath, right? Because that's a fun story. That's an easy story. It's the one all about the underdog beating up the big bully. We like to tell that story. How many of you heard the story of David and Bathsheba when you were going to Sunday school? <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't teach that one to me in Sunday school. I heard all about how David was the great king. David was the one who slayed Goliath. David was amazing. God loved David because David had a heart after God. Well, then I started reading that Bible that I kept ignoring. And that was one of those stories that I was like, what? Wait, 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 wait. This was the great, amazing king. And he did all this? All right, so I'm going to read through the story. I, I'm not having it up on there because it's, it's going to be a decent bit of reading, so stick with me. But it's a good story because it is so real. And as I'm reading this and as you're hearing about the things that he did, remember, this is the man who's considered the greatest king of Israel. 
So in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. David didn't go out with his army anymore. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. This woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she's Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. Wait a minute, I thought they just said it was the wife of somebody else. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I'm pregnant. So David sent this word to Joab. Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, you should go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants and did not go down to his house. And David was told Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, haven't you just come from a military campaign? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are stayed in tents, and my commander Job and my Lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will do no such thing. And then David said to him, well, stay one more day, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation, he ate and drank with him, and David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants. He still did not go home. So in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. And in it, he wrote, put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw from him so that he will be struck down and die." Now, when Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had, brought her, had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. I'm going to pause there and just reflect on all the things that David did here that sure do not sound like the perfect, upstanding Christian that I was told he was. Right, he goes off on a roof, and maybe it was an accident, maybe he wasn't trying to be a peeping Tom, but it's like, you know where your roof overlooks. And he just so happened to see this beautiful lady. And he didn't stop looking. Right? There's his first problem. And then he, he said, well, yeah, man, hey, Go find out more about her, right? He let, his, he let his imagination start going. I want to know about that pretty woman. And then even when he found out, hey, she's married to one of your soldiers, he said, eh, she's gone. Why don't you bring her up here? And she came. And they did what men and women do together. And he's figuring, oh, I got away with it. He... You know, her husband's gone. He's not going to know anything about it. Everybody that's around me listens to everything I say. They're not going to say anything. And all of a sudden, she comes up with, uh, hey, I'm pregnant. You know, he knows, wait a minute. Everybody knows that her husband's gone. And even if the servants don't say anything, there's going to be some rumors about, hey, wasn't she up at the palace with King David there? And so instead of fess up, instead of dealing with what he did wrong, he did like so many of us do. He tried to think of a way to cover it up. He says, oh, I know, I know. I'll get her husband to come back. He'll sleep with her, and then everybody will just think that that's, that's his kid, right? Because, you know, he was back for a few days. 
And what husband isn't going to go see his wife when he gets to come back for a few days? He wasn't counting on the fact that, man, Uriah, Uriah's got way more morals than I, King David, do in this moment. Uriah couldn't even think of the fact of doing something for his own pleasure while he knew that all his friends and brothers and countrymen were out at risk. To the best of David's ability, he tried and tried and tried. He even got the guy drunk and said, come on. It wasn't happening. And still, David could not give up on trying to cover up his failure. He sent this man to his death to avoid people knowing that he had failed. Now, how many of us, if we're really honest with ourselves, have to admit that, you know, there's probably a few times in my life where if I had the power of a king, I might have sacrificed somebody else to save face. I may have sent somebody off that I really didn't care that much about because I cared more about my reputation in front of the eyes of others around me than I actually cared about this person who was, eh, really expendable. But here's the thing. David had somebody that even though he was the king, he had somebody he could speak honestly to. That's where we pick back up. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, you know, there were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except for one little ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised it, it grew up with him and his children, it shared his food, drank from his cup, even slept in his arms. It shared his food, it was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. So David listens to this story, and he burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, this man must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. And Nathan said to David, that man is you. He called him out. You are the man. And this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you. I gave your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all of Israel and Judah. And if all of this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore... This sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, I am going to bring calamity on you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to the one who is close to you. And he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You're not going to die. But, man, this is a big but, because by doing this you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will die. Now, after David had gone home, the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had borne to David, and he became ill. But David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted and spent his nights laying in sackcloth on the ground. The elders of his household stood beside him to get him up from the ground, but he refused, and he would not eat any food with them. On the seventh day, the child died. 
David's attendants were afraid to tell him that the child died, for they thought while the child was still living, he wouldn't listen to us when we spoke to him. How can we now tell him the child is dead? He may do something desperate. Now David noticed that his attendants were whispering among themselves, and he realized the child was dead. Is the child dead? He asked. Yes, they replied, he's dead. And then David got up from the ground. After he had washed, put on lotion, and changed his clothes, he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went to his own house, and at his request they served him food, and he ate. And his attendants, they asked him, why are you acting this way? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept. But now that the child is dead, you get up and eat. And he answered, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. Because I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious enough to me and let the child live. But now that he's dead, why should I go on fasting? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba. He went to her and made love to her. She gave birth to a son, and they named him Solomon. And the Lord loved him. Man, what an up and down story that is. All right, think about this. David is revered by the Israelites. David is loved by God. David is considered the greatest king of Israel. But David is a murderer. But David is an adulterer. But David had moments where he despised God. Now, how can all of that be true? How can someone who did all those things still be loved by God? like I would think about myself. How can someone who has done all the things I've done really honestly be loved by God? Because see, if God only loved perfect people, he wouldn't love any of us. Because not one of us earns the love of God. By his grace, we receive it. He gives it away freely, just waiting for us to say, yes, God, thank you. It's no different than when you're a little kid and you've just gotten in so much trouble. Eyes are red, face is red, all snotty from crying. And man, what's the best thing after that? When your parents come and say, just, just come here, wrap you in their arms, give you that big hug. It's like, oh, oh, you still love me. God's just like that, parents. He's not going to withhold telling you when you've done wrong. But all he is waiting for you is to say, oh, I'm so sorry. And he can't wait to just wrap you in his arms, comfort you, and remind you that he still loves you. So knowing that God loves even imperfect Christians, but it's always God, how do I go forward knowing I'm an imperfect Christian? How do I live that life in that tension between knowing I'm called to be perfect, but knowing I can't do it? Right, what can I learn from this cheating, murdering, God-despising man that still somehow managed to find God's favor. The first thing is knowing that we are forgiven, but our actions are not excused. Our forgiveness is not an excuse to just do whatever we want willy-nilly 
knowing, hey, God, God said he doesn't want me to do this, but eh, I'm forgiven. It's not the way it works. We call it the retentive heart. We're going to mess up. But we can't just be okay with the bad things that we do. The second thing we learn from this is that we all need a mentor. We all need someone who can speak those hard truths to us. Right? Even, even when you're friends with someone, it's really hard to, to be genuine and call them out, right? Because we're afraid of that rejection, right? I don't, don't want to hurt my friendship. I don't want to drive this friend away. They might get mad at me when I tell them that what they did was stupid and wrong. I'd get mad. But if they're a real friend and they really value you and your relationship and your impact in their lives, like it says, like iron sharpens iron, we sharpen each other. That's how we sharpen each other. Sharpening is rubbing against rough things. You don't sharpen something by pushing it up against, you know, laying it down in a nice, soft, fluffy pillow that feels good. You sharpen by rubbing against hard things. We all need that mentor that's willing to be the hard thing to sharpen us, to call us out, to tell us, hey, Michael, what you just did right there, do you really think God would smile on that? Do you really think that that's okay? Now here's the third thing. When the time comes, we have to be humble enough to accept that we've screwed up. That's serious humility. That's serious difficulty. Right? None of us likes to admit our failures. None of us likes to wallow in the things that we've done wrong. Right? We want to make excuses. We want to say, well, 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 it's because of this, this, or this. Right? Or just pretend it didn't happen. When we fail, we have to be ready for the fact that there are consequences. A lot of us want to just focus on, well, I expect unlimited mercy from God. Right? I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. It should be easy. I, I should just say I'm sorry and then, and then we're done, right? And it doesn't work that way, y'all. Because a true God, a just God, is not a lying God. And sometimes, like it or not, if we mess up bad enough that there's negative consequences. Sometimes the merciful thing is that we didn't experience the entire brunt of the consequences. Because the wages of sin are death. Right? That's what we're told. That, that's the ultimate consequence. And not just death, oh, I'm in the ground, but death, I am separated from you, Lord. I don't have real life, Lord. So when we're sitting there crying into our milk about I don't I don't I don't like these consequences, God. We've got to remember they could be so much worse. And God doesn't give us more than we can handle. But God doesn't give us less than we need. And so that consequence that God allows you to suffer, it's what you need. It's not what we like. It's not what we want. It's what we need. Because if there were no consequences, come on. We don't change unless there's pain. Right? <laughs> 
That's just the truth of it. We all know it. And now finally, we don't hold our failure against God. Right? David didn't sit there and rail against God. And say, well, why'd you put Bathsheba on that roof? Why'd you let my eyes drift there? Why'd you let her come? Right, there's so many steps that you do. Well, God, you should have just stopped it there. God, you should have just stopped it there. And God says, you should have stopped it there. I gave you so many chances to turn from the wrong things that you were going to do. Now, it doesn't say it here, but if it's anything like when I'm doing wrong, that still small voice popped up plenty of times. In David's head, going, oh, David, see if you do this. Hey, 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 maybe, maybe you should just turn around, quit staring at her. God gives us chances over and over and over again. But us and our humanity, we're, we're really good at shouting that voice down. We're really good at letting all the other voices in our head drown it out, right? I know I shouldn't look, but oh, I want to look. I know I shouldn't get to know her, but man, I just want to. I know I should face the consequences of the fact that I slept with her and got her pregnant, but I just, I don't want to. Everybody's going to look at me. Everybody's going everybody's gonna to have that look in their eyes of, of judgment. I hate the way that feels. tell you what the judgment of people is so much preferable to having that convicted judgment of God that just oh man it settles in you right there's oh it just it eats up at you and you can't hide from that I can hide from people I'm pretty good at hiding from people actually right I just close my door close my curtains duck when the UPS guy comes up, right? I have not figured out how to hide from God. I've tried. I've tried. There's been plenty of instances in my life that, man, I was just trying to run away from that, that terrible pit that I now recognize as that Holy Spirit conviction oh, you've done wrong and you still haven't repented. And until those, that happens, it's just going to sit there. You can run, you can try and do all kinds of things to distract yourself from it, but as soon as that distraction's over, there it is again. And guess what? It's not God's fault. I'm the one who chose to do the things that I've done. I'm the one who tried to turn my back. I'm the one who tried to run and hide. I'm the one who ignored God saying, hey, all you got to do is admit to it. All you got to do is accept your licks. Right? Boy, I can remember being a kid, getting in trouble, being sent to my room to wait for a spanking. Right? That waiting was the worst part the worst part. I mean, the pain was momentary. It was so short-lived. Looking back on it, it's like, man, a couple of spankings, ouch, my bottom hurts for a little bit, and then I'm done. But all oh, those, those minutes, I, I swear it was like days waiting so scared of how terrible it's going to be, building it up in my mind, trying to think of ways I could lessen the pain, right? Maybe I'll, maybe I'll slide a pillow down there, right? I'll try and put my hands up real quick. Hands don't count, I was told. But once it was over, it was over. There wasn't a grudge held. There was still love there. There was still good to come. has so much good in store for us. 
Sometimes we just got to get through our spanking that we deserve. We don't want to admit it in the middle of it. But looking back, I've realized probably deserved a bit more, and there was actually a whole lot of mercy thrown into the mix. Whole lot of mercy. Even when I was bad, even when I did the things that deserved the consequences, backs weren't turned on me. I wasn't rejected. In fact, honestly, it would have been easier to just say, I'm done with you. Because it takes effort to, right? It takes effort to discipline your kid. I try to explain to my kids, I'm like, do you think I like being the warden? I'm grounded when you're grounded. Who else is going to keep an eye on you? But you know what? It was worth it. Because without those consequences, who knows how terrible things would have gotten. Without the consequences in my life, who knows how terrible of a place I would be in. Because of the consequences, I am so blessed. I mean, it's all I have to do is say, Lord, help me count my blessings. And that list is un ending it is unending I'm surrounded by friends I'm surrounded by family I'm surrounded by God this beautiful creation here I've got a full belly too full after Thanksgiving but to recap these are the lessons that we have from the story of David and Bathsheba of how do we go forward as imperfect Christians. First, remember that we are forgiven, but our actions are not excused. Second, we all need a mentor. If you don't have one, I encourage you to reach out, be vulnerable with someone that you trust. You know, don't just grab a stranger on the street and say, hey, tell me when I'm messing up. Find somebody that you trust, somebody that you respect, and do the hard thing of saying, you know what, I want you to call me out. I give you permission to tell me when I'm messing up. And then third, be humble enough to admit when we screw up. And that mentor comes to you and says, ah, I saw what you just did there. Fight that urge to get defensive. Keep those excuses in your mouth. Don't let them out. Meditate on it. Think about it. Pray on it. Admit it. And fourth, don't blame God for your failures. They're yours. They're not his. Fifth, be ready to accept that there will be some consequences for your failure. And finally, don't dwell on those consequences. Just like David did, I mean, he, he tried his best to say, God, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm repenting, I'm fasting, I'm laying in sackcloth on the ground. From everything I read, sackcloth must have been really uncomfortable because that's always the bad thing they did, right? It's not like those cozy, comfortable sleeping bags we've got now. But once it was done, once, once he knew, well, that's, that's what God had in store for me, he didn't shake his fist at God. He didn't complain to God. He went and worshiped. Boy, that's a hard one to do, isn't it? Say, God, you just hurt me. <sighs> but you know what, God? I worship you. In fact, I thank you. Thank you for not shying away from the hard lessons that I have to learn to be better because I want to be better. And if you have that perspective, if you know... Right? This, is, this is part of faith. I, I know God wants good for me. 
He's not some little kid plucking the legs off of the ants. He is not trying to burn us with his magnifying glass. He is loving us and correcting us in love to better us. I'd like to ask the rest of the worship team to come up here and ask you guys to join me as I close in prayer. God, I do worship you. I'm so grateful for all the things that you have done in my life. Not just the easy things, but the painful things too. Because I realize that those painful things were for my growth, were for my good. And knowing that, I can thank you. God, I, I'm so grateful that you don't turn your back on me. Even when I've turned my back on you, that you just wait so patiently. And Lord, I just ask that if, if there's anybody out there that may have their back turned to you, that may, that may be feeling bitter towards you, struggling with you that this can be a reminder that no matter how we feel in the moment your love never ends for us your goodness does not stop everything you do in this world is for our good you guys to go ahead and join us in some worship and like we mentioned before we, we practice free worship